First John, if you would, chapter number three. We've looked at from the beginning of the chapter, we'll be in, beginning in verse 19 tonight, but the beginning of the chapter, notice our attention is drawn to an aspect, a, a character trait of God, and that is His love. In fact, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. This chapter, I believe, is, is focused on the love of God. In fact, it's a reoccurring theme throughout the book of 1 John, the love of God. In verse number 19, our passage for tonight, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Lord, I thank you for this time we have tonight, these moments to look at your word. Lord, I pray that the truth would be clear, that your word would be powerful, your spirit would convict and correct us tonight, Lord. And we would not miss the message found in these verses, the message that, Lord, I believe you'd have us to focus on tonight. Lord, would you touch us and change us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I want to talk tonight and entitle the message, The Blessings We Discover. I did a couple searches this afternoon, or this morning actually, on some hidden gems. I did a search on hidden gems in the USA. And there's a few places that I found. Or one place was called the Apostle Islands in Wisconsin. I've never been there, but this is a hidden gem that you're supposed to go and visit. Roaring Fork Motor Nature Trails in Tennessee. Mount Hood National Forest. And here's a hidden gem. gem pictured rocks in Michigan. In Michigan, we have a, a hidden gem that is on the list for the whole United States. Imagine that. A hidden gem here in Michigan. Well, then I went further and I typed in, well, what about some hidden gems in Michigan? I wanted to see if I'd ever been to what people would classify as a hidden gem. And surprisingly enough, um, Bridgeport was not on the list. I was quite shocked. I looked at a couple different lists and couldn't find it. I, I thought for sure it would be there, but they had the Sleeping Bear Dunes on there. Have you been there before? It's a beautiful place. A Gilmore Car Museum. Apparently that's a hidden gem. I've never been to the Gilmore Car Museum. To Commodon Falls State Park up in the Upper Peninsula. I've been there a few times. Beautiful place. A hidden gem, they say. And some springs, I don't know if I'm going to say it right, Kitchitty Kippy or something like that. I'm probably saying it all wrong and I will get a hundred different texts how it's supposed to be pronounced. And that's wonderful. Thank you for knowing how to say that hidden gem of a, of a spring. The, maybe the largest natural spring or, uh, in all the United States, I think they told me, is, is what I read today. But then I went a step further. I said, if you, if you go to the hidden gem of the United States and the hidden gems of Michigan, is there anywhere else you can find hidden gems? And the answer is yes. I typed in, hidden gems found at Walmart. This is good. And, and, and actually, there are lists of hidden gems at Walmart. Here's one. Flower, shimmer, and shade eyeshadow palette. This made the list. Apparently, you can't live without this, ladies. The flower, shimmer, and shade. Or oh, how about this? The vegan leather iPhone case. It was on the list, the vegan leather iPhone case. It said, not only does it look nice, it's good for the environment. That's what they said. There's a Brioga deep conditioning hair mask. A hidden gem at Walmart. I have to admit, I, I, it must be, and I've never seen it before, a, a hair mask. And then a Swan Comfort Turkish Bamboo Towel. Swan Comfort Turkish Bamboo Towel. Not to be confused with the Swan Comfort Swedish Bamboo Towel. This is the Swan Comfort Turkish Bamboo Towel found at Walmart. Hidden gems. Now what are hidden gems? Hidden gems are, are things that maybe we miss in life. Maybe that if we just go on the normal trail, we'll, we'll miss some of the, the special experiences or, or locations or special tourist attractions or apparently at Walmart, special things you need for your life. As someone once said, if you can't find it at Walmart, you don't need it in your life. And it's probably an element of truth to that. And I want to bring our attention to this passage because I believe this passage, under the context of 1 John chapter 3, brings us some blessings because of God's love that we can miss if we're not careful. 
You know, some blessings, I believe, shown to us in 1 John 3, 19 through 24 that I want us to discover and look at. I want to direct our attention to this passage and, and don't want us to miss some of the things that God has because of his love for us. The first thing I want to notice is actually a negative one. It is the path, the, the path of feeling. There's a path of feeling inside of this passage, and that's what 19 and 20 say, and hereby we know that we are the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. We have to understand, first of all, and be reminded that our heart, our path of feeling, is not an accurate path. Our heart, the Bible says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the Lord answers that, I, the Lord, search the heart. But the problem is our heart is continually trusted. If we're not careful, we continually trust our heart and our feelings. In the midst of this pandemic, we are often, if we're not careful, driven by our feelings, what we see, what we hear. Understand something that when you turn on the news, and I'm not saying you shouldn't look at the news, I'm just saying be careful. You understand that each, each station wants you to watch that station. They're trying to sell advertisements, and the only way they can do that is to make their news more interesting than the other station's news. All right, so when all the news is the same about the virus, that's about all the news out there, is it, is it not? There's not much else going on right now. There's no sporting events, and uh, there's just hardly anything else going on. It's just the virus and how it's affecting us. Understand, the only way to make you watch their channel is to make it more sensational than the other channels. Yeah, that's, that's what they're trying to do. If we're not careful, we get sucked into the trap of the sensationalism. I'm not saying there's not a problem. I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm trying to bring some reality that our heart is continually trusted. And all of a sudden, we hear this, and we hear this, and we hear this, and we hear this, and we listen more to our gut than to our God. We begin to worry because we've looked at our heart. It's our Heavenly Father. It's continually continually trusted. You see, we've created a pattern of that in our life. That's often how we decide what to eat. Well, what do I feel like? What am I hungry for? And, and at our house is no different than your house. We have the same conversations. My wife says, well, I have this in the freezer. And I'm like, oh, it's perfectly fine. It's wonderful food, but I don't feel like it. All right, it's not because of some spiritual reason. You're like, oh, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like meatballs. I want chicken wings. So my wife pulls out the chicken wings out of the freezer, and that's what we have. Or I don't feel like chicken wings, I feel like burgers. And then I don't feel like burgers, and we order in some pizza. We have listened to our heart, and it is continually trusted if we're not careful. But it is completely treacherous. It is completely treacherous. The heart is deceitful above all things. You see, our hearts must be maintained and, pat and patterned after God's word. It amazes me what, what our hearts, what direction our hearts, our minds can take us. In fact, I read this statement. It was about marriage. This person said this, I don't believe that marriage is an institution, nor is it sacred. It is, in its purest and truest sense, a contract. There isn't anything magical or spiritual about this. I believe a specific marriage is made sacred when those two people give the best of themselves, when they sacrifice for one another, when they mutually invest in their own union, what, that's what makes it holy. If there's magic, this is where it lives. And I found that statement not from a, a secular or unsafe person. That I found from a pastor who has pastored for, on his website, 20 years in the ministry. Where does one come up with that, that marriage is not an institution, a sacred institution? Not because you read your Bible, that's for sure. I read my Bible and I find out from Genesis chapter 2 that God made man and woman and let him leave his father and mother cleave unto his wife. It's a sacred institution. You don't find that from the Bible. You don't find that from a wonderful godly marriage. You find it from a treacherous, deceitful heart. That's where you find that. Your heart, when it speaks deceitfully, it takes you down a whole path that you don't want to go. A 65-year-old woman named Deborah Hamill, last, I believe it was August, was pulled over by a police officer in Oklahoma for a broken taillight. 
Now, if you want, you can actually see and watch this interaction on the camera that was captured from the officer. Pulled over for a broken taillight. Now, I don't know about you, I don't like to be pulled over. I mentioned a few weeks back I was pulled over for, for uh, having a, a, uh, a stop that the officer thought was not as much of a stop as I thought it was a stop. And I, I figured you can stop at 20 miles an hour, it's just a sliding stop, I guess, but he wanted a full stop, apparently. No one likes to be pulled over. You know, like in fact, my kids were in the, in the car on our way to school, and he was, very, he was very merciful, and he just said, make sure I stop next time. And so I said, yes, sir, and I, I have. I've tried really hard, really very hard to stop at that stop sign. It's hard, though. It's hard, folks. You pray for me. No one likes to get pulled over, but she got pulled over for a broken taillight. And he gave her an $80 ticket. Now, no one likes to get pulled over, but no one especially likes to have a ticket. But in this video, in this encounter, this lady, Deborah, refuses to sign the ticket. She says, I'm not going to. Apparently, she said, I'm not going to sign it. She, she said that she didn't think she deserved to pay $80 for something that she can easily fix, even though she admitted that it had been unfixed for six months. When the officer asked her to step outside of her car, now listen, I don't like to get pulled over, neither do you. I don't want a ticket, neither do you. But, but most of us would, would imagine that if we're asked to get out of our car by an officer, our response would be to what? Get out of the car. Right? They're, they're the, 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 the law enforcement officer. No, not Deborah. She refuses. She refuses, and she begins to swear at the officer and roll her window up. And then she drives away. <laughs> now, where on God's green earth do you think this is going to go? All right, that you cannot you cannot run an officer. So sure enough, the officer gets in his car and pursues her. So now she's in a police chase for an eighty dollar broken taillight ticket. Eventually, she ends up pulling over, but again refuses to get out of the car as the encounter goes. So he pulls her out, and while he pulls her out of the car, she kicks him. 65-year-old lady for an $80 broken taillight uh, ticket kicks the officer. So he does, for those watching the enjoyable thing, he tases her. <laughs> and then he arrests her and takes her to jail. And now does she not only have a broken taillight, she was charged with a felony for assaulting a police officer. You see, her heart led her in a direction that was treacherous. Her heart led her in a direction that said, this will end up well, I can get out of paying this ticket, and, and at the end of the day, that ticket was the least of her concerns. She, in fact, lowered the concern of that ticket. But now she has felonious assaults of a peace officer. Oh, but I love what David says in Psalm chapter 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. You see, one of the gems in this passage is to realize that our heart can condemn us, but our heart is deceitful. Our heart is not to be trusted. Our heart is to be trained, all right, after God and godliness. It's treacherous, but we can train it. Well, I see in this passage, though, I see the power of the Father. Look with me, if you would, please, in verse number 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. I would say this is one of those little nuggets there in the, in the scripture. This is one of those passages. This is one of those things that if we're not careful, we can miss where the Bible says, hey, don't miss this. God is greater than our heart. I would say it this way. He is impressively influential. He is, he is impressive with his power. Let us inform us of, of something that John is telling us. The maker of the universe is greater than our heart. Those worries, he's greater than the worries. The false lusts and desires, he is greater than that. The false securities of our 401k, God is greater than all of that. The deceitful heart that we have, God is greater than our heart. God is greater than the mountains. He can move those with the power of a seed of faith. God is greater than the mightiest storms. He calms those with just one or two words. God is greater than diseases. He heals those with a touch, a word, or some dirt and some spit. God is greater than the bills. Just catch a fish and find a coin. God is greater than giants. He silences those with a pebble. 
God is greater than death. He conquered that through the resurrection. And yes, God is greater than your heart and my heart. And we can trust Him. What a tremendous hidden gem of God's love. What shows the greatness of our God. A teacher asked a boy this simple math question. Suppose your mother baked a pie. And there were seven of you, your parents and five children. What part of the pie would you get? A sixth, the boy promptly replied. <laughs> Teacher kind of chuckled and said, I'm sorry, my son, you don't know your fractions very well. Remember, there are seven of you. Yes, teacher, replied the boy, but you don't know my mother very well because she would say she didn't want any pie. I would say when our heart is tempted to mislead us, we can say, but you don't know my God very well. The love of God, the hidden gem of this passage, is the greatness of God. God is greater, greater than our hearts. Oh, then a gem followed right after that. And he knows all things. Not only is he impressively influential, but he is infinitely informed. Infinitely informed. I don't know about you, but in, in my house growing up, it seemed like my mother had eyes in the back of her head. I, I, I to this day, would, would attest to that fact that it seemed like my mother would know what was going on in another room. That it was before the time of cameras in every room and nanny cams and, and uh, security cameras. And it seemed like my mother could be in the kitchen and she could be baking something and she could hear my brothers and sisters fighting. I, of course, was in the corner praying and reading the Bible, of course, but they were messing around, obviously. And, and she'd call out and, hey, kids, settle down. And it seems like my parents would know that. I remember one time my mom had asked us to clean our room up, my sister and I. I believe I was about five and she was about seven. We came back about six or seven minutes later, if it was that much. We had done a great job of cleaning. We had shoved everything under my sister's bed. We thought it was a great idea, apparently. And my mom, in her infinite wisdom, as only a mom has, right? Did you clean your room? Oh, yes, ma'am. There are times in my childhood that I remember clearly. This is one of them. The other one is the time my mother attacked a spider with her slipper. That's a different story for a different time. This is one of those times, though, when my, I remember my mother asking us, did you clean your room? And, and uh, responding, yes. And, and then my mother did the strangest thing. She said, let's go check. Now, why would she do that? Yeah, because she was infinitely informed as a mother. Then she walked into our room, and, and the room was spotless. I, I, I give you my word, that room was spotless. Then my mother did the strangest thing. She got down on her knees, and it wasn't to pray. She stuck her head and looked under the bed, and sure enough, she saw everything that, that, she, that we had put there. Believe it or not, she wasn't pleased. Our plan wasn't as good as we thought it was. But the Bible says that God knows all things. It, in, in one sense, it is true that, that we can't escape from His knowledge it should uh, strike fear into our hearts, but it also brings comfort to our hearts. God knows all things. He knows tomorrow. He knows today. He knows next week. He knows what's going to happen. He wasn't surprised by any of this. God knows all things. He was infinitely informed. You see, a hidden gem in this passage is the power of the Father. God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. But lastly tonight... I want to draw our attention. If you would, look in verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. We could stop right there if we were not going to be quite accurate with this passage and say, well, here's some things that are pleasing in His sight. But John goes on in this passage to tell us what is pleasing in this passage to his sight. Because he goes on in verse 23 and says this, and this is his commandment. Remember in verse 22 he says, we keep his commandments. Verse 23, and this is his commandment. What is pleasing in his sight? Verse 23 tells us that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. You know what is pleasing in the Lord's sight? It's faith. That's what this verse says, it's faith, believing in Jesus Christ. That is the prophet of faith and to love one another. You see, what, what God finds pleasing is faith in Him. 
Or we could say it's living righteously, and no doubt if we do the will of the Father, the will of Him that sent us, then we are pleasing the Lord. And, and Jesus asked that, that we obey His commandments. But in this passage, in these verses, John gives us the gem of faith again, a theme often repeated in Scripture, a theme we can't forget. We're so tempted to walk in our own fear rather than His faith, the prophet of faith, the African Impala, they tell me, can jump to a height over 10 feet and cover a distance of 30 feet. Yet, if you have one in your backyard, even though it can jump 10 feet high and 30 feet in distance, you can keep them in any enclosure with a three-foot wall. They tell me that the reason you can do that is these animals will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will land. And even though they can jump over the wall, the three-foot wall, at least three times as high as that wall, and at least uh, ten to almost, over, almost ten times in the distance of that wall or more, you can easily stop them. And Christian, I would say that sometimes our faith, though we can soar mountains and soar to great heights with the power of God, we limit the power of God, because we don't know where our feet will land. And here, John tells us about the prophet of faith. It brings us in this passage assurance. It defeats doubt about salvation, about the goodness of God. In this passage, it brings us answers to prayers. In the answers to prayer, we see we can ask anything in His name. We can ask and God will grant that. Answers to prayer. And it brings us in this passage activity of the Spirit which he had given to us, verse 24. You see, the prophet of faith brings assurance, answers to prayer, and activity of the Spirit. You see, this love of God is a wonderful, wonderful thing. About 15 years ago, we were up on this platform. Pastor Lett was right there, along with Pastor Saunders. And I committed to my wife. We got married in this auditorium right here. I love, honor, cherish. Doreen's love, honor, cherish. Not obey. Someone forgot that vow that, that day. Not on purpose. It's caused me a lot of problems the last few years. No, not really. Not really. They didn't forget it, but not, no problems there. I'll tell you what. I remember in college, they said marriage is a good thing. So findeth a wife, findeth favor, take the favor with the Lord, and findeth a good thing. But if they had told me how great it was to have a wonderful life like Doreen, I would have got married years before. Twelve or thirteen, probably for sure. <laughs> wonderful things about marriage. You know, the other day my wife goes to Sam's Club, and she brings me back two bags of pecans. You're like, well, who cares, Pastor Howell? I care. My wife knows I love pecans. And she brought me not just one bag, but two bags. That's a blessing. You may not care about that, but I care about that. That's a, that's a hidden gem. You know what my wife does as well? She laughs at my jokes. She thinks I'm funny. Now, I know that I'm funny. There's no doubt in my mind. But, but my wife, she, she, she helps me. She laughs at my jokes. She helps me be humble when, uh, when we play phase 10. What a blessing. The hidden blessings. Yet, if we were to know all that God's love brings to us, we would have got there years ago. The hidden blessings of God's love for us. Murfreesboro, Arizona. They say that an 8.5 carat diamond was found. It's found by Bobby Oscarson. Apparently, there was a, I'm sorry, Arkansas, Arizona, Arkansas. There was a state park, and it's Arkansas's diamond site. And there you can find diamonds in the State Park 37 and a half acre search field. And anything you find, they say you can keep. And the park works hard to ensure that visitors have every opportunity to find buried treasure, regularly digging up the earth to loosen more and bring gems closer to the surface. In fact, uh, Oscarson is not the first one to find such a valuable gem. They've found in this gem park over 227 certified gems. 
And while eight and a half carat is a large diamond, it's not the largest that was ever uncovered at this site. And it's called the Crater of Diamonds State Park. If I can't have us imagine something even more wonderful, and that's God's love. A crater of treasure of God's love. And inside of it is found assurance, answers to prayer, activity of the Spirit, the knowledge of God, the infinite power of God, that if it touches our heart and our life, will forever change us. Amen. Have you discovered the hidden treasure of God's love? Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this passage. Lord, thank you that as we look to you and rest in your love, Lord, we see the treasures that you bring to us. Lord, I wonder tonight if there's someone who's been touched by your word tonight, maybe has been doubting, perhaps their salvation. Lord, maybe they've been doubting your love for them. Lord, I pray that you would solidify in their heart tonight the love you have for them. All you tell us that we love you only because you first loved us. And I wonder, my friend, if tonight God touched your heart. If perhaps you've been trusting your heart and not trusting God. If you've gone down that path of your feelings that are the power of faith. Oh, would you come back to Him? I wonder if you're watching tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. God loves you so much. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That shows the love of God that He'd give His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sin. So you don't have to go to hell. You can go to heaven. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And if you trust Jesus and Him and Him alone to save you from your sin, He will. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And tonight, my friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you could pray a simple prayer. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Oh, would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. My friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you pray that tonight with me? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. The Bible says, if you ask Jesus to save you, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, my friend, if you've never trusted Christ, you will do that tonight. What about you, Christian? You need to bend to me tonight. Come back to the love of God. That's what John said. Behold, what manner of love is this? The Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God all the privileges, the power, the blessings that pertain to that. Would you pray tonight? for your word and for your love. Lord, may we not forget or miss what you have for us. Lord, may we not replace your love with anything else, but rest in it for assurance, answers to prayer, and the Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.